Hey everyone, here we stand at the end of another season of Star Trek. This one is the Worlds second part. Worlds apart. World, here we heart, start. Hearts broken in two. We should get we should get that guy to be a guest or the band. Either Steve either one. Perry? Steve Perry or the band. Either one. Since they're not talking to each other, make maybe they can uh, communicate through the medium that is podcast and yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, Steve Smith was recently on a Drumeo channel explaining how he broke down uh, his journey grooves, which was an interesting thing. Oh, nice. People might want to check it out. Steve Smith does not look like a rock drummer. He's a, he's a, <clears throat> he's the epitome of someone who does not look like a rock and roll drummer. Um, so we're here for Voyager's second season. We just finished all 26 episodes, I think there are, in this season of Star Trek. And now we're here to give our uh, sort of wrap-up thoughts, as we usually do. Clay, how are you? I'm good. Um, as we were talking about a little bit before this started, I am having a very difficult time remembering a lot of these episodes, even with uh, the list in front of me. I did prep work. I sent you. I sent you things on yeah. Discord. I was like, "Here's all the episodes, and yeah. this is what we thought of them." Well, it's I. You know, the ones that we listed were the best ones. I was like, "Oh yeah, I, be, I have a basic memory of most of those." But then I looked at some of the other ones, and I put. Po- I said I pulled up. Uh, the Wikipedia list, and the first one that I saw was Twisted, in which a region of space distorts the interior of Voyager, and I have no memory whatsoever of that episode. Got you all twisted up like a pretzel. Yeah. Yep, we'll get to... I, it, really, I, it really shits you up. <laughs> it's mostly a product of our um, our rankings uh, system, and I think, well, it, it is that, because our best list was a clear five best, it, like mm-hmm. easily works out that way, so it was very easy to make that list. The worst list is a um, another kettle of fish, which we'll get into shortly. So, uh, general thoughts on season two. It's, it's worse than season one, right? That's a, that's a takeaway we can all agree on. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Um, for some reason in my mind, I remembered it starting off better. No, oh, okay. But but based on. The, the, the based colors on this, in front of you. Yeah, it's that is not the case. <laughs> it's basically a tale of two. It's a tale of two seasons in one. Up until Threshold, maybe and like Meld is good, but like either Dreadnought or Threshold, um, it's a pretty middling season of a lot of twos and threes for us. I gave one a one to Prototype just because I hated it so much. Yeah, um, I was just I just saw that. Yeah, that's a one and a three. Yeah, and that's the Prototype's the one with the the worst looking alien robot yes <laughs> not in a roger corman movie right <laughs> yeah it's the uh Bolan of a friends the faceless smash faced uh, robot guy uh but that it's a good half a season of pretty middling stuff um yeah and not to spoil our worst list but it is like when i was trying to come up with the worst list i looked at that whole list and i was kind of like you where i was like i don't remember what happened in a lot of these episodes like which one is projections i don't remember which one that is at all the the ones that stick out to me are Elogium, which I think are the space slugs that keep bumping into into Voyager. It's that episode. Yeah, but I don't remember yes. what else happens in that one. Twisted, I remember the ship gets twisted, and then Tattoo is Chicote uh, doing his like spirit uh, animal run where he meets the aliens that claim to be the ancestors of Native uh, Americans. Yeah. Can't can't forget that one. I'm gonna say that's the worst episode of the season. Tattoo? Just because I just because I remember it. Oh, okay. Like, I feel like it <laughs> I feel like it was bad enough that <laughs> it, it stuck in my mind. <laughs> I think it's just it was the the novelty of Chicote being by himself was kind of yeah. it was kind of memorable in that one. Yeah, and then the second half gets better. Um I wouldn't say it's a great season or anything, but we have a couple fives in there mixed in. We have some fours and then at least a little bit more gray and less red, which on our color system means uh, a better episode, Grays of Threes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tale of two two seasons, I think. Uh, it, I feel like it went by kind of quick, but I don't remember a lot of mm. it, so maybe it went a lot slower than I expected to. Season one was also very short compared to this, but I just think, like, comparing it to season one, I just think that it was... Um, it felt kind of the same, but without the fresh energy of a first season to it. Really? Yeah. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. if anything was noticeably worse except for the the aspects of serialization that we can get into in a little bit. But in, like, a general sense, it felt kind of the same as season one, except it didn't feel as novel. Yeah, I think um, I think the biggest problem with this show going into the second season is that um, 
it has kind of abandoned anything that made it stand out from Star Trek. And um, because the Maquis stuff is more or less gone, uh, the fact that they're trying to get home even doesn't really feel like the core of the show so much. Yeah. Because they seem to just be taking a lot of left turns. They easily Uh, give up on the goal of getting home if they have to for the for the purposes yeah, of the episode like, oh, shit i you know we got we we were gonna take the leftovers home from that place we stopped for lunch but i left them at the restaurant yep is there any way we can go back and get them it's like well it's six weeks of travel at <laughs> maximum warp in the other direction but yeah i think we can do that we got nothing else to do imagine if they if voyager made it home and someone died like the week before it got home and it would be pinned oh. back to any of these episodes where they just dilly dallied for a week and a half or whatever yeah. to get back stuff yeah that's sad yeah here but that was i remember did you watch um band of brothers no no oh man great show uh the most depressing part of band of brothers was like the last episode where it was like the war's over and here are all the people who died through freak accidents before they could go home (laughs) you know and it's like that's the most depressing thing where it's like the war's over we're all packing up to head back but you know johnny from brooklyn died in a a jeep accident right because the tire blew out and the jeep ran off the road on the way back to the ship or something yes yeah yeah the uh the sort of tertiary deaths and voyager has some tertiary deaths i guess at this point um so i I guess that the the bigger thing about it like the the thing that makes season two of voyager kind of um unique maybe not across star trek but at least for voyager and i'm going uh based on what the patrons and discorders and youtube comments tell me is that this is the only season that's really going to attempt a season-long story across oh, it okay uh and they did that with the tom paris's late storyline which ties into the seska and the Kazon, and then the the mole being on voyager uh we talked about that in depth as the episodes were going around um mm-hmm. i don't know if a good starting place for you is just that uh one patron on a recent comment said that they at least appreciated the, the the sort of balls of attempting something like that. Yeah. Um, what do you think about what do you think about that? Well, was this was um, it ballsy? I guess is like the first question. I don't know if the person said it was ballsy to say, but they they appreciated the fact that they did it rather than not do it. Yeah, I appreciate the fact that they did it, but like you know, what one, one of the things that I noticed or i don't know if notice is the right word but the way that what i felt is that as we were going through that right you know neither neither one of us had any idea where it was going and we were critical of it um for really kind of feeling that way and uh, i remember a lot of the responses from listeners kind of being like oh well you know wait till you see where it goes you know it's gonna you're gonna feel like an idiot when you see where it goes. and then we got to where it went and i didn't feel any different mm. because i never felt like they really had a grasp on the like where they were going yeah yeah like the end point sure i guess was in they had it in mind in a note card fashion i guess but it never felt to me like what they were doing was really laying any groundwork for this story that was supposed to um, run across a a variety of episodes. Yeah. Because it starts off so weird. Yep. Like, it's that that first episode where he gets chewed out for for gambling. Is that the first one? Yeah, he's in the holodeck doing something. Yeah, playing pool or something. Yeah, and then he starts showing up late for his his, uh, shift and stuff. And it's just not really interesting. And it's not really laid out in a way that feels like it's driving towards anything and i don't know maybe that's if i think you could do it that way but it it takes a bit more finesse than they gave it to to have a character do these kind of things that seem random but ultimately snowball into something something larger yes yeah yeah they could have (coughs) excuse me they could have um there, there is a way to like effectively build that by having these little vignettes of Tom Paris like brushing up against uh, the the rigor of Starfleet in a way that he disagrees with, and he you get the sense that maybe he's just tiring of it. But they all felt so pointless and inconsequential to anything, mm. even though they were building towards something quite consequential. And it, it's really just the. Um, I I think that that like I can 
I can agree with the patron in the, the sense that, like, yes, like Voyager and Star Trek at this time should probably be trying to do something like that, mm. um, especially because I learned that this season airs concurrently with DS9's fourth season, which is to this point our oh, highest boy. rated of Star Trek yeah. season. <laughs> so, like, they, they were clearly had to do something there. And I think that... DS9 just made all the right choices about how you have to do 26 episodes in a season while you are having something somewhat serialized happening in the background of it, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is that you don't have specific plot points that carry on for 10 episodes. You know, like you and Enterprise never seemed to learn this either because the Zindi arc suffered from things like uh, from a similar idea. DS9 would just have in the background of our story there is the bubblings of a like a building cold war that is turning into something you know right and it wasn't like there's a spy on ds9 who's it going to be for 15 episodes as you're right. as, like and right. there's nowhere to go with that so when you have a more general this is what the environment is for our story you can actually build on it just by having standalone episodes that work towards that end and voyager suffered because it didn't do that. It did the enterprise. It's sort of a proto enterprise thing of just like endlessly kicking the can down the road because they don't know how they can escalate this in a way that's going to be satisfying in an episodic yeah. show. So yeah. you just have endless scenes of watching that guy talk to Seska saying, I demand to talk to Seska. You never see what he talks to her about. You never even see if he talks to her at all. I don't mm-hmm. think I can't remember. Yeah. You have the Kazon who are kind of lame because they can't be super threatening early, even though we liked them in the, the finale because they actually were kind of uh, threatening and consequential and they they felt like they had something about them that they were actually competent and doing something. So I think that that's really the problem with Voyager season two is that it's a, it's an enterprise problem of it just, it had this story, but it doesn't know how to span it across an entire 26 episode season, which is a difficult problem to have because it's a lot of TV. So it's just, they keep repeating the thing that you already know over and over and over because it's episodic again. So people might not have seen the previous episode. They just keep hammering this point. And then at the end, they have the final episode where the plot is revealed. It's reconciled like incredibly stupidly. And then they kill the person that was the mole. And there's no questions right. asked anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of it, <clears throat> you know, I think it all comes back to the core of your idea, you know, because like I, I think especially something like the Tom Paris plot, if if the, the center of your show is still very strongly <clears throat> about Voyager trying to get home, Tom Paris getting jaded about that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, ha- has a little bit more uh, to, to grasp onto. Right. And, and like has more foundation to, to build on than just, throwing these bits in there in these sort of episodic um you know week to week things because like it's never obviously the idea is and very very low on the list of things the show is about is oh it's about voyager trying to get home sure yeah okay but there's so much other normal star trek stuff on top of that that pushes the idea that they're trying to get home so far down yeah, yeah that it it really when you try to do a serialized thing like this you're you're not you're not um rooting it in the concept of the show which is this overarching idea that is affecting everybody yes and so you can you can have these if you if you took these these running plot lines and you had them more solidly tied to this idea that they're trying to get home Maybe Paris is getting d- jaded or or uh, disenfranchised because they keep stopping and doing other shit, you know, like that. Yep. <clears throat> that gives you more stuff to work with than just kind of throwing it into the pot and hoping that it it it, it cooks well. Yeah, yeah. He's um, <coughs> it's interesting because excuse me, like the the trying to get home thing is central to Voyager in a way that. The producers, I don't feel, hit it hard enough because if if you mm. don't stress that fact, Voyager is really not very different from TNG because it just feels like it's the right. ship visits a place every week and, and this right, is the thing yeah. that goes on. So if you don't have that sense of 
like this is why you know I've said it before way at the start of this like if you were to remake Voyager I think it's the series that could most benefit from a remake because I think mm-hmm. that nowadays you could really effectively string this plot of uh, this idea of like the ship is on a very long journey home with different factions on it and like the relationships are kind of crumbling as things are moving along and it's this it's this battle to hold the ship together and to hold morale together and to stop people from pulling a Tom Paris and just like saying like fuck this and getting off there and flying off in a shuttlecraft or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of meat on that. It's it's kind of like the it's um I guess in some ways it's similar to like shows uh, something like Deadwood, I guess, because it's it's like how do you hold together this thing that is vital to everyone but everyone has different interests at the same time. Um right. like how does that work? And I I think the Voyager just really suffers from that episodic structure, which makes it feel like they might as well be in the alpha quadrant for a lot of these episodes, because there's no difference if this was, if you just replace the ship with the enterprise, it's the same episode. Yeah. And kind of to what you were saying earlier about deep space nine, deep space nine figures it out because you've got like at the core of deep space nine is that everybody on deep space nine has their own relationship to the station. Yeah. And so, all of the running plot lines are born from that, whether it's Kira and her relationship to the station and to the Cardassians, or if it's Cisco being the being the guy who's put in charge. Like they they all are they all all lines draw back to the concept of the show, right? Whereas Voyager just doesn't really do that. And I mean, they had they and again. We don't have to keep hitting the hitting the, this nail, but. It, like the setup is so good for this show. Yeah, it it's is. such a it's such an interesting setup for a Star Trek show that they they jettison so quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. No, I, I agree. Um, <clears throat> anything else to say about the plots of season two in general or anything? Um, no, I think they, I mean I think we covered the serialized aspect of it. It's um, mm-hmm. yeah. I I just. My final thought about that that serialized story is that I just think I don't think it worked on any level really. Like the the Kazon mm. were ineffective. Um, the Kazon are pretty much going to be gone by the time we get to Basics Part Two in the start of the next season, which is good. Um, really, like that they're they're done after the the, the premiere of season yeah. three. Yeah, they they might wow. get mentioned once or two, one or two times after that, but they're not. They don't make a serious appearance on the show after that. I don't think. Man, that's like when you when you finally stop seeing billboards for Dunkin' Donuts when you're driving out that's, of New England. Just start seeing Jack in the Box things. You know you're heading yeah. somewhere. I mean, we've you're been complaining in, you're about in Krispy it. Krispy Kreme country now, boy. <laughs> How long can they keep running into the the Kazon? It's got to come to an end at some right, point, and yeah. it's going to come to an end. Interesting. Uh, completely apropos of nothing, yep. I was <laughs> glanced over at the Wikipedia list of episodes, and my eyes landed on Dreadnought, mm-hmm. and. Um, it says a highly advanced Cardassian AI missile that has been reprogrammed by Balan Torres is found in Delta Quadrant. But I uh, I read it backwards, and all I saw was Al Cardassian. Mm-hmm. And I I was like, wow, I do <laughs> not remember that character. I think I would like that character, but I do not remember him. Everyone's favorite uncle, Al Cardassian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I do want to say generally, though, I think one of the changes in this season is I feel like the episodes as a whole – as they exist in in my memory of them, um, they started skewing more darker in the endings, especially. Yeah, um, I would agree. Where with it was a lot more, you know, your final scene is a, is a is a bit of a downer, uh, yeah. or a little bit more ambiguous, which I think works better in the the, the later season when they start um, telling some more interesting stories. Yep. Um, Meld, Death I mean, Wish would do that. I think Deadlock yeah. kind of does that. The Thaw, Tuvix, Resolutions. Yeah, yeah. You know, things that, that kind of make you think a little bit or, like, stick with you a little bit more. Um, and feel... Um, but even even so in there, as we talked about, like, you can't get away from those certain sitcom scenes Yeah, where it's like, you know the whole other fake Voyager just, or not the, the duplicate Voyager, everybody's dead, but Harry Kim's on the ship and he's yep. like, well, it's like I never left captain. He's like, well, <laughs> what do well, they call okay. you doctor over here? That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so like, it's, you know, it's, it's a weird tonal balance that I think they have, they have a yep. little trouble with, but they are skewing a bit darker. Um, 
in this season towards uh, towards the end. Yeah, the- which. I was just going to say, which does kind of work for them, I think. Um, it does, the better episodes. The, the first half feel to me like um, Star Trek sci-fi plot episodes. Yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. yeah. Like um, the ship gets twisted, running into a swarm of space slugs, stuff like that. Like that. that's very much a uh, stock uh, Star Trek type plot episode. Yeah. Things, I think. You know, and not to, not to jump back on this too, but like... <laughs> um, I think one of the mistakes they might make is that they don't totally know how to to infuse the concept of the show in a way that makes sense because like I feel like the only time they really get into that stuff is when they do episodes specifically about it when you whether it's uh was it cold Fi- is cold fire one where it's like the thrust of the show one of the plots is we think we can get home because it's a it's a caretaker person yeah it's the cast episode they find the the second caretaker uh, yeah place. yeah and or or the other one which maybe season one i can't remember where they're they're looking through the pinhole and talking to the romulan or yes, whatever is yeah, that, of the needle is that the this first season se- that's the first that's season. first season like they do these episodes that are specifically about trying to get home but when they're not doing those it's not really something that's affecting anybody yep and it's strange it's strange to me like you don't have to have the episode be explicitly about trying to get home but also have it it, in order to have it be something that is still considered and still dealt with yeah and it's um you know just i don't know if you give the show credit It, it it is a tough concept to pull off for so many episodes you know, like it's a oh sure, yeah. I, yeah. I don't think either of us of, of us are saying that like this is an easy fix because you just have the yeah. show focus on that. It's a it's a great concept that will obviously I think struggle with the episode order that these shows have to do because like yeah, that's that's true too. Yeah, you know, like three seasons of seventy five episodes, you've pretty much covered all the at that point. If the characters are still kind of crumbling and the premise of the show is still intact, it, it it'll probably feel like you're just sort of stretching it out by that point like that's a lot of time to pass through yeah voyager voyager would would benefit from modern seasons yes 10 episodes it was like 10 episodes yeah where you can kind of really get everything kind of concentrated down um and really kind of get into the into the nitty-gritty of this stuff i think they would benefit from that yeah know? yeah drastically um and, and obviously to contrast with ds9 that's why ds9 can do so many episodes is because it doesn't the, the the plot is not exactly the same thing you can branch off right, in different directions yeah. i is it do you find it interesting that all three of these shows um that we've watched after tng your deep space nine your enterprise and, and your voyager here they eventually get to a point where they're like yeah we got we got to change this up guys we got to do something different like it's is that a ratings thing do you think I mean, in terms I, in, with Voyager, do you mean with like with because uh, the big thing I think of is that adding Dorn and Seven in Voyager and DS Nine, but we haven't gotten to Seven. Well, yet. I, I'm thinking like you know in Enterprise, the third season is the Zindi arc, the entire. Oh, thing. sure, right. Or, and uh, Deep Space Nine, they do the Dominion War that lasts the like three seasons or however long that lasts. Yep. Um, and in this one, they try it, <laughs> but it doesn't go so well. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a This is like this is like Voyager is like the dark universe of um Star Trek. <laughs> what, by dark universe, I mean do you remember when Universal came out and was like we're rebooting our horror universe? Yes, Tom Cruise to be is like in. Yeah, to to be like Marvel and DC, we're going to use the Universal monsters and they put out this picture of it was uh Tom Cruise um Russell Crowe uh what's his name anton chagor whose name is escaping me um, oh javier um, javier bardem, bardem yeah. i think i want to say penelope cruz but i could be wrong like a, a, the, all huge huge stars yeah and it's like this is going to be the dark universe and um they made the the mummy movie that was absolute trash and then nobody ever talked about it ever again <laughs> <laughs> that's what it feels like with this it's like they, they tried it it didn't work and now we're just gonna forget it ever happened yeah, I think so. I mean, it's – I uh, I didn't give much uh, sort of – I thought it always was just kind of um, 
like internet idol chatter of not really knowing it, uh, what they were talking about and just wanting someone to blame. But uh, Braga and Berman get a lot of blame for running the franchise into the ground. And mm-hmm. you could argue that like anybody will run this this many episodes of a franchise into the ground after the 10,000 episodes of Star Trek or whatever. It's inevitable to happen. But I do see... Uh, like DS9 and Voyager was clearly a split mm. to me. Like yeah, the, the, yeah. The, in terms of the production teams that worked on the two shows, the Voyager offshoot it led to Enterprise because it's pretty much all the same people working on it in those two shows. Mm-hmm. And DS9 was the like evolutionary offshoot that uh, flew fairly high, but it never had an offshoot off of it that advanced the franchise anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. I, I just at this point I'm mostly struck by how similar Voyager and Enterprise are to each other. They they're yeah. really similar in a lot of ways, in my opinion. Yeah, you would I'm surprised um <clears throat> by the time they got to Enterprise, Braga like Enterprise feels like the idea where Braga comes up with the idea, or Berman and Braga come up with the idea, and then they go, Hey, you guy from the writer's room who right. wrote some good episodes <laughs> why don't you take this over here's the basic idea it's the first flight of the first enterprise go nuts right you put know? our names on the credits as executive producers right exactly yeah because yeah. clearly clearly they were all burnt out in that show it's so much i can't believe Bra- bragg has been on this show since season one like he he goes yeah. through basically yeah. seven episodes i think he leaves before the seventh season but he goes through like six seasons of voyager and then does enterprise it's so much tv it's yeah. so much yeah, agreed. <clears throat> I guess they, they they probably wanted the cachet of him doing it, but it makes you slightly more sympathetic to Voyage or to Enterprise or whatever. But it's um, I agree. His smart move would have been to take much more of a ten thousand foot bird's eye view of everything yeah. and bring in yeah. new uh, showrunners and stuff like that. Especially because, like, I feel like the importance of of name recognition for like a showrunner is a new thing yeah, with in, Ameri- prestige. in American TV. It only came yeah. about with prestige TV. Yeah. Like in I like in in British TV, I know it's more of a thing where it's like a lot of these shows are have very uh specific voices at the helm that people know that okay, that's this guy's show or yeah. it's one, one of One or these two guys, guys writes every episode in it. So there's no <clears throat> staff writing coming in to to write right. the voice. Yeah. Um Whereas in American TV, I mean, American TV is just so digestible and, and uh, that nobody really gives a shit. Yep. Like you, you rarely get something like um, like Cheers that had the same guy directing. I think he directed like more than half of the episodes of Cheers or something. Yep. Yep. And the writing team, the creative team on Cheers, even even that, though, they're doing it. Nobody knows who the fuck those guys are. No. You know, at least at the time people do now because it matters to people. Though, but. <laughs> So I'm surprised that if it's a cachet thing, that it really mattered that much. Because you'd think that you get their names in the credits. Okay, that satisfies the suits to make it look like we know what we're doing here. Right. And then, yeah. you know, I'll just uh, kick the tires when I think I need to. Yeah, it's probably more, maybe it's less about the audience knowing it and more about the the studio recognizing that these two guys have been doing this yeah. for a long time. Therefore, it makes sense for them to be in charge of it. But, yeah, I mean, the... The American showrunner comes in importance mostly by, since they're not directly, I mean, I, directly, it's hard to say, like, they obviously are working on every show that they do, but they're they're not writing every single word of what's going on, and they're not completely mm-hmm. responsible for it, but it, it um, it's more about the, the, sh- the show, choice of showrunner is what gives the show its kind of attitude i guess for lack of a better right. word like it, it, it's right. overall they're important to providing the kind of <laughs> direction that a show would want to go to even if they don't create every episode of it yeah it's really interesting too <laughs> in modern television how like pedigree is is a lot more important <clears throat> yeah for people who are on these things where it's like you know uh Marvel starts a new show and they pick this person to be the showrunner. It's like, oh, that's not a name I recognize. And you look them up and it's like, oh, they wrote on Rick and Morty for a season. Before that, they worked on uh, You Better Call Saul. Right. And then before that, they worked on uh, you know Deadwood or something. Like it's like you go, oh, okay, this person knows knows what's up. Right. Like that that becomes <laughs> a lot more important in a way that it never was before. I was 
I was, I was <clears throat> having this argument. Well, not an argument. I was trying to make it a discussion, not an argument. But you know how TV gets friend, hot. Yeah, our, uh, you know how our friends can get with mm-hmm. that stuff. And I was trying to say how Dune was not a good movie, and they said no. <laughs> you were no, wrong. I love Dune. Um, I was trying to say how. If you go back and you you know he our, our friend was arguing that like uh, it, picking the right people to to do a show is is you know incredibly important which it is but I my counter to that was like these people who work in television work in so much television that you can look at someone's filmography and go like I don't like anything this person has ever worked on. But then you find the show, oh, my God, that show is amazing. I can't believe they worked on that show. Yeah. And vice versa. Like, you can pick someone who has a, a pedigree of making of, – of garbage television, and they make something great. And you can pick a person who has a pedigree of amazing television, and they make something that sucks. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a weird kind of thing where pedigree kind of matters, but it, it's definitely not a – like with any job, really. It's not a guarantee that whatever is going to come out is going to be good or bad. Yeah. It's the um, <coughs> television is a very uh, if you think about it, a bit like a sports analogy, like the more people you require to be on your team in a sports game, mm-hmm. the the less you can pin it on the one person. You know what I mean? So like te- mm. television has so many jobs involved in it. It's like down to the writers, the actors, the directors and everything like that, like getting, you know, everything has to line up. It's more in line with something like like American football where there's a lot of people on it and it's it's the opposite of tennis where you're or golf where you're like entirely responsible for your performance right, yeah. there. So the it's, only it's hard. the only di- the only exception being basketball because uh, so much of basketball is we got one really good player and then Just a bunch got role of guys. Players. Yeah, that, we that's get the guys British TV model. Well. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and then if you got a team that's got two of those guys, championships for 5 years that's straight. The finals baby. Yeah, yep. No, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think that that's that's right. I think that that correctly describes how this TV works. And with that, we can go to well, let's do a quick power ranking before we get to the best and worst episodes, and we'll wrap this up in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, we'll start with we'll start with the worst character, I guess, is the, the easiest. Mm. <clears throat> Maybe we don't have to rank them all the way through, but. Um, I think it was Neelix for both of us in season one. Has anything changed about that? Do you feel less hostile towards Neelix or more hostile? Um, I think I feel less hostile ter- towards Neelix. I actually think the worst character in the season might be Chakotay. Oh yeah, I got okay. Let's yeah, let's go individual season. It, it probably is Chakotay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I think they totally like just nerf him so badly <laughs> in this did. season. <laughs> they insult him quite yeah, dramatically. It's- <laughs> it's really like they emasculate him quite a bit, like yep. multiple times, yep. and they don't really give him anything interesting to do. And anything that he does do is just slathered with this hokey, fake Native American horse shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just every time he, he they give him these moments where they try to show that he's got some like fire left in him, but it never comes off as as believable. And it's. You know he's the he's the leader of the Maquis yep. here. You know, Allegedly. and he's he's just a, a pushover. No, I'll I'll always think of Chicote in this season is when Tom Paris uh, Paris like brushed against him and he knocked him to the floor, <laughs> and he's just like pathetically looking up at him as he's picking up his yeah. pad or whatever. It's I, like that is I pathetic. still can't believe. I think the worst moment is in the episode uh, the payoff to the Tom Paris storyline. When he finds out what has been going on, and he's like, "You didn't tell me about any of this," and and Jane was just like, "No, I didn't think that it would help if you knew what was going on." It's like yep. it's like so he's the number he's the number two, yeah, number one or whatever. She went, she went around him to Tuvok, who's lower lower ranked, just because she trusted yeah, him. and like her explanation is kind of bullshit, <gasps> and he has all the right in the world to be more angry about it, and it's just so yeah, uh, yeah, it's insulting is a great word to use, yeah, yeah, he's um. He suffers in the same way from the serialized plots um, suffer everybody because his anger cannot carry across episode start points and end points. You know, like mm-hmm. he <clears throat> he's not allowed to get progressively angrier as this season where he's getting shit on is proceeding. So he he Chicote's like 
summing up Chicote would just be saying like in any scene Chicote will say I can't believe no one told me about this and then he'll just stand in the background for the rest of the show right like that, yeah that's that's pretty much his entire characterization yeah I mean that's that's that episode where he finds out what's going on it like it feels like Janeway just told him like like they're married and Janeway yeah. just told him that he's she's been sleeping with Tuvok or yep. Paris or something. Yeah, he, and like, just, he just takes it. And then, it. like, yeah, he gets he gets uh, uh, cucked out pretty bad, to use a phrase, <laughs> a couple times in this season. Because later on, the what's this? Uh, Seska steals his mojo out of the back of his neck. Yep. yep. And manufactures a child that she then is raising with uh, Maj Ka. Uh, Maku- Makushla. Makushla, yeah. And, <laughs> and it's like, man, can you get more, like, emasculated than that no he really is they they take him for a fucking ride in this season yeah i can see why when they when he ends up with janeway on that planet he's like yeah you know this is it's better than being back on the ship where nobody respects me (laughs) i mean just to completely destroy him it should it should have just ended with uh you know as they're getting back on voyager it's just chakotay saying that this has never happened before i just you're just so i don't know it's just no what should have happened is when they were down there on the on the planet, at a certain point, Janeway should have come back, and she's like, "I've fallen in love with this monkey." I'm sorry. <laughs> like, There's literally nobody else on this planet, and you you've still found someone else other than me. Amazing. Yep. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, good. Well, thank you for reminding me. Chicote, I think, did plummet to the bottom of this season for me. Um, after Chicote, there's a bunch of middling. I would put like, I'd probably put Neelix there just because i don't know what neelix's purpose really is but like harry kim and Bolana and tom paris are probably mixed in with each other there yeah i'm still waiting for tom paris to do something interesting because he's he's not- pro- he's probably the top just for this season just because he had that serialized story you know sure <laughs> but yeah i don't know if he's ever gonna uh, do anything i think um once he comes back <laughs> in the next episode with all those Neelix people ships. Yep. yep. I'm looking forward to that. Seeing him yeah. just with a, a bunch of Talaxians just hauling ass across the galaxy. Coming coming over the ridge like Gandalf at the end of uh, <laughs> Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I always... With a bunch of Talaxians waving spices and carrots over their heads. I was not a huge um, Lord of the Rings fan, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, maybe this is extremely insulting and someone's going to get very upset by this, but Gandalf's resurrection in those movies is kind of similar to me <laughs> to the, the Borg cube in Picard season one. Like, interesting. Okay. I'm expecting big shit, and he just rides in on a horse and hits people with a stick. And yeah, it's like, what I, the hell? That's, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <clears throat> I wonder how, I mean, I don't know how it differs in the book. Um, yeah, does he like light that whole thing on fire and they'll just right. die? And he, yeah, like, is there a whole bunch of stuff that's happening that we don't see off screen that is like specifically spoken about in the book? I don't know, but uh, yeah, I even, but it is also one of those things where it's like the book was written long enough ago where the way that that plays out might have been kind of novel at the time. Sure, I, just, yeah, I, I guess just like just just his being there is enough to turn the tide kind of is the yeah. point of it but yeah yeah maybe maybe the books don't get specific about what he did and um they didn't want to they didn't want to make anything up to make it seem like it was too extreme or something but it's it just like for all they were talking about and giving him a new title and everything gandalf the white you, you think he's going to level up as a wizard there and really do some right shit. yeah yeah you think he's going to be like captain marvel showing up at the end of the yes. game there yeah <coughs> so after oh, excuse me it's cold so after those um those three uh, well, I guess Kess would be mixed in, mixed in there too to make it four. That's kind of that lump. Then mm. it's um, Janeway, the Doctor, and Tuvok. I think are left. Um, Tuvok's still my one. I think mm-hmm. uh, to say to describe Tuvok why Tuvok's a one in ways that I haven't before. Uh, I was thinking about it. Tuvok is um, Phil Hartman of this show on SNL, which is that (laughs) he goes in every story and it improves it somehow. Yeah. And there's not a lot of the cast that can do that where you just could feel like you could get away by adding uh, Belana Torres into any plot. Sometimes she would really stick out as a weird choice, but Tuvok amplifies and makes everything better 
every episode that he's in, and the same yeah. way that Hartman did on SNL. You really could take any of these episodes and swap out whoever the main character is with Tuvok. And it would, it would be, be better. Instantly think, better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of power, power rankings, Phil Hartman, top three SNL cast members has to be, right? Yeah, if he not is. number it, one. It's Farrell, him, and I don't know who the third would be. Um, I feel like it. I mean, it's interesting because those are both like, obviously, those guys are amazingly talented and funny, but they're both also like utility players to a certain extent. Yeah, I, I really value that. And <laughs> like the, the, yeah. the top, the top performing SNL members have to do everything. They have to be in yeah. every kind of player. Because mm-hmm. so, like, do you think does I don't know if Belushi fits that role. Do you think Belushi? F- fits that role i don't know he's not too as much of a, familiar with his stuff yeah he's but. too much of a farley energy which is very specific yeah. i think like yeah. i th- this i'm not elevating uh the person i'm about to say but chris parnell struck me as a poor man's will ferrell a lot oh sure sure he's good and yeah. he can be the lead but he's also fantastic as just a background player in in things yeah, you know who actually get uh, uh, deserves a lot of credit is Keenan Thompson. Yeah, you know he's yep. been on that show for twenty years. I know. Yes, it's, it's been for he's the longest it's running insane. cast member. Yeah, he's good too. He he's he's yeah. the same thing as he can fill all those all those roles. What about? I mean, Eddie Murphy basically carried the show on his shoulders for two years. or Yeah, whatever. It, it might be Eddie Murphy. I think. Um, I'm just I'm going through the the later era here. No, everyone else is kind of bit players. I, I'll, I'll go with Eddie Murphy. It's, it probably yeah. is for those the or the early to mid to late eighties. Yeah, it's what an interesting that's that's an interesting pedigree of of uh, of actors and performers. Yes, because you've got so many interesting people that went through there and and just like flamed out who ended up becoming megastars later, like Larry David and yep. Julia Louis Dreyfus. Robert Downey Jr. was on that yeah, fucking was, show for a summer. season. <laughs> Which is insane to think about, but kind of makes sense in retrospect. Yeah, some weird way. <clears throat> I like yeah. the people like, um, <coughs> like uh, Mark McKinney from Kids in the oh, Hall yeah. was on it for a season. Yeah, yep. Or, um, I mean, Michael McKeon was on Michael it McKean for a while. One se- well, I think he's one after, season. Yeah, he was on it after uh, Christopher Guest and. Harry Shearer were both on at the same time. So right. we had everybody from Spinal Tap and not at the same time. <laughs> uh, would you, would, is Tuvok your number one or are you going to put someone else in there? I think I would go Tuvok number one, Doctor number two. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd, I'd agree. I'm, um, I will say the Doctor needs to start getting pushed a little bit harder to maintain this high power ranking for me personally. Yeah. I feel like they're just not really, they're not really grabbing that character. And by the horns in in a lot of ways. And some episodes are very good with him, but I feel like there's a lot of places you could go with him, and they haven't gone there yet. Yeah, I'm worried that they're going to saru him pretty soon, mm. where they're going to take the thing that makes him unique and basically strip it away so he can move about the ship more easily. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> or like, you know... I I was going to say when they give Data his emotion chip, but I actually do like that because it... it it's a it's a change and and it's a very drastic change that doesn't go well right um but like i feel like something like that is coming for the doctor where he's gonna be they kind of didn't they they've been kind of kind of teasing that a bit where they've been trying to figure out how to get his holographic projector to work places other than the yes i think they did it in one episode but they keep talking about it as if it hadn't happened but he's yeah i don't know around the ship yeah yeah, I don't know what they're going to do, but I, I'm, I'm worried that they're going to do something that is going to be like, oh, we need to do this to feature the Doctor more, but it's going to make him less interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's... um, <coughs> Like put put him in a robot body or something. It's, <laughs> just, it's like a rolling uh, television screen on wheels. He's just he's everywhere. Because <laughs> I, I do... Uh, we haven't really talked about it, but it, like it must be difficult for him and the cast to do the scenes where they have to interact outside of the sick bay because he's always just on video talking to them. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's tough. Then Janeway would be my number three, although Janeway skews closer to the Kim Torres Paris group than she does the top two, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Anyway, she does get like out of everyone who's not Tuvok and. 
uh, the doctor, she does get some pretty great moments in the season, though. Yep. Um, and she is pretty crucial to some some of the better episodes. Yes. Yeah, she's uh, just by her role has to be vital. Um, my, I think my point still stands is that I, I don't really know what Janeway is outside of being the captain of the ship. Sure. I, I have a hard time sure. defining her as a person. That's fair. Yeah, I would agree with that. Hopefully they move it forward. Um, I know she gets, she'll gets she get some... Uh, her and Seven have a lot of conversations, so I think that that'll probably lead to something after the next season. On-screen chemistry spurred on by real-life backstage hate. That's right. Jealousy. Get the cat claws out, ladies. So let's go to the best and worst episodes. Uh, we'll, do the, uh, we'll do the worst first, I guess. So uh, as I mentioned at the top... Um, it was tough to come up with the five because I have the top two just because we did them by rankings and it worked out that way. Uh, but numbers five, four, and three are, in my opinion, any combination of the 37s, initiations, elogium, non sequitur, twisted, persistence of vision, tattoo, maneuvers, and threshold. You had mentioned <laughs> that um, tattoo might be it just because it stuck in your mind and maybe that was because it was extra awful. Yeah. So here's my question to you. Uh, Threshold, does that deserve to be on this list of the five worst? Threshold is the Space Salamander episode. Spa- oh, I forgot about that. Holy shit. Um, it's legendarily reviled. We, yeah. we thought it was bad. We both gave it twos, though, mostly with the idea that it's really just the ending that fucks it up. Yeah, I think from what I remember, I think our... our our kind of uh, read on that one was the story actually isn't that bad. Yeah. Um, that it has a lot of potential to it, but they just kind of, yeah, they kind of break it at the end there. <clears throat> I also, would say. It's also so memorable. It's hard to put right, on the list. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, that's one, like, I would say that is not as bad as Tattoo because at least they're trying something. You know, like yeah. threshold yeah. is is they're they're taking kind of a big swing that probably could have maybe used a, some refining and maybe a second draft, couple couple practice swings before stepping up to the plate. Yeah, but tattoo is just I don't know. It's it's just so bland. Yeah, agreed. So I I don't and, I, you know, and that's uh, since we've started the show. That's my thing is i'm always going to give more points to a, an episode that that takes a big swing and misses than one that just kind of yeah you know agreed. limps to first base there, there's something about being memorable um yeah and maybe there's the argument that the least memorable ones are probably the worst episodes so yeah for- to, if 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 threshold is is a is a big swing on a strike three a tattoo is is getting a hit by by a pitch That's i think <laughs> So I guess I forgot to mention Dreadnought also falls into that that category. So you could include that one, the Cardassian, Dread, Al Cardassian. Dreadnought, what your country can do for do you. For you. So number two is Resolutions, mm-hmm. which we just watched the other week. It's the uh, Chakotay and Janeway on the planet with the monkey episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Prototype, just because I gave it a one, it knocked it down to the worst episode. <laughs> you actually gave it a three, so you might disagree. Uh, yeah, with it, I think that's I think that's a big swing one for me. Where I, I from what I remember, I, I um, production values aside, yeah, I remember thinking that the what the the story they were trying to tell was actually kind of interesting. Yeah, um, it's just not done in a very uh, good, um, satisfying kind of <laughs> way. Yeah, I thought the. Production qualities aside, I thought the script was bad in that one. I thought it was mm-hmm. just one of those, like, here's a bunch of things happening that have to happen to make this ultimately come together towards the end. And mm-hmm. I think it just kind of fell apart in terms of what it was actually supposed to be talking about. Um, where the others maybe maintained a tenuous grasp on mediocrity, which is, you know, uh, whether or not that's good or bad is to be debated. So that's it. I will put prototype as the worst just because of my one, then resolutions, and then a whole bunch of that early stuff in the season. Dreadnought was pretty bad, now that I'm thinking yep, about Dreadnought it. Yep, Dreadnought was bad. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Here's the best, which are a little bit more memorable, starting with number five. It's Deadlock, which sounds a lot like Dreadnought, but Deadlock is the double duplicate Voyager ship episode. Right. Mm-hmm. Number yep. four is, you can let me know if you disagree with any of these, number four is Death Wish, which is the Q's episode, the Q commit suicide episode. Oh, sure, yeah. Great Woodstock references, everything you want from a Star Trek episode. 
That guy might go <laughs> down got, in memory as one of the most memorable <laughs> Star Trek appearances of all time. We got one card. We got one card we can play to get Jonathan Frakes on the show. <laughs> and this is where we've chosen to use it. <laughs> Number three is Meld, which is Brad Dourif as uh, Lon Suter, uh, the serial killer, and mm-hmm. Tuvok mind melds with him. Number two is Life Signs, which is the doctor gets a girlfriend, the Vidian girlfriend, who he mm-hmm. hooks up to his sick bay and then has a nice Chevy, 50, 57 Chevy trips with her. And then number one, maybe surprisingly, Tuvix. Yeah, baby. Tu- Tuvok and Neelix get melded. We both gave it a five. It's our, it's our only co-fives at this point. We both gave one other five at separate points. I gave one to Prime Factors in season one. And you gave Life Signs a five, but this is Tuvix. This is our first agreement that this is a five episode. So would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I think that's probably the best episode of the season. It's definitely the one that was uh, I was most riveted by <clears throat> yes. as far as the story and, and the actual like uh, ethical problem that they were in. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah. Which one was the one? Is the Thaw the one with Michael McKeon? Yes, that's the, the ah, clown episode. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yep, so that's it. Tuvix is number one, then Life Signs, then Meld, then Death Wish, then Deadlock. I actually think the top five are fairly decent. That's like not not a bad list. I, I could kind of take or leave Deadlock. I don't think Deadlock is all that great, but I think the top four mm. are pretty good episodes. Yeah, I would agree. I think Deadlock is is cool, but it's um uh it's it's good, but it's uh yeah, it's not super a little hollow or anything. To it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah, the landfill of it all at the end is a little bit distracting. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is you get used to Ensign Kim. You're going to get used to this weird, wacky shit happening on Star Trek. Roll credits. So that's it, <laughs> uh, Captain. I'm I'm also on Voyager. I <laughs> I know exact. This is an exact copy. I, it's exactly the same. So let's just pretend this never just, happened. Just call me Harry. Was, yeah. uh, they should have started calling him. He should have been called Harold Kim on the other ship for some reason. And then when he comes yes. over, he's just, guys, just just call me Harry. It's fine. Well, that's the thing that's so weird about it, right? Because like usually when they do these things, <coughs> excuse me, these types of stories, it's like the other ship is is a literal mirror image or something. And there's some weird thing. that It's not that. It's just like the, the other ship may as well have not existed. Right, because nothing changes. That's and that's why it disappearing doesn't mean anything because it's there's right. no loss. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it is. It is. Uh, it's it's weird in that way where it means nothing, but to Harry Kim, it it means everything because he <laughs> watched all his friends, <laughs> all of his friends blow up, but now they're also here. So that's a lot to a lot to handle. I think. Yeah, I still think about the. Um, just when the when the, the the doomed Voyager ship is about to blow up and Chan was like, Harry Kim, you get the fuck out of here. <laughs> take take, <laughs> take the this baby. baby and run away. <laughs> what was that conversation like with the mother where it's like, We're so sorry to hear about your baby dying, but we found you another one. Yeah, we found just the exact same person who's gonna love it just as much as you do. Do you happen to by any chance know what a changeling is? Okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's it. For those, those are the best and worst episodes. That's our thoughts on Voyager Season 2. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you want to support the show, patreon.com slash Lipensky file. It's the best way to do it. Leave all your comments, listen to other podcasts, blah, 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 early access, everything at patreon.com slash Lipensky file. Thanks for a great 2022. This episode might come out in 2023. If it does, happy new year. But we're talking about 2022. So, Clay, anything you want to say before we go? Uh, If it is 2023... Amanda and I, this month in January, will be starting our uh, run-through of the curated list of video nasties on on Patreon. Yep. So uh, if you want to hear us talk about some um, illegal gore made illegal by the, the British government, <laughs> then uh, join us over there on Patreon. Yeah, George Washington and them had the right idea, I guess. Breaking away was the... The yeah, because George of Washington wanted to watch I Spit on Your Grave without it being hassled by the king. <laughs> he was spitting on the graves of redcoats, Clay. Don't you be fooled. Um, Thomas Jefferson really wanted to get an uncut copy of Cannibal Holocaust. <laughs> He's not going to pay any stamp tax to get that shipped over. No. Nope. Not going to stand for that. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this, our wrap-up of Season 2. On to Season 3. We'll be back next week with Basics Part 2.
finishing off that storyline. So thanks very much for listening. We'll see you later.